What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Rant and Review. Here we're talking about the big AEW Dynamite from a single de Mayo, May the 5th, 2021, and the Blood and Guts match. Before we get to that, of course, I want you to remind you guys that this is social media, so, you know, helping out the channel. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. In fact, I want you to throw that subscribe button off the top of a Blood and Guts cage through some crash pads because it'll help poor Chris Jericho on his tour of Fozzie before he can come back to AEW and beat up MJF again. So if you want that to happen, make sure you hit that like button down below. Well, originally it was said or rumored that Blood and Guts was gonna be the whole show, which I could have seen, but uh, they didn't do that. This was actually, uh, I think it was only like the last 45 minutes of the show or whatnot. We had the first hour of Dynamite in which we had a lot of other stuff going on involving other wrestlers, including the North American, sorta of, kinda not really elite version of the Bullet Club, whatever the hell they're called. Uh, <laughs> Kenny Omega, and Michael Nakazawa. Yeah, Michael Nakazawa found his way onto Dynamite. They took on Eddie Kingston and a John, oh sorry, John Moxley. That was the opening tag match. Um, a lot of it, it was funny seeing Nakazawa try to actually act like he could hang with these big boys. Uh, Omega, Omega's doing Omega stuff. Uh, him and Eddie Kingston, that might be a good match uh, in the future. I see at some point in time they're going to have to have a one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's on a Dynamite or some other show. Uh, but Nakazawa wound up getting in there and getting his butt kicked, of course, and Kenny left him, <laughs> left him basically to get brutalized uh, by the the the, two, the duo that doesn't need a name because they're not a faction of Eddie Kingston and John Moxley, but after the match, the Young Bucks came out with some very poor fashion decisions, and <laughs> Gallows and Anderson blindsided Mox and Kingston, and then this proceeded into a very, very long beatdown where basically the entire elite group basically just tried to injure and permanently <laughs> injure Moxley and Eddie Kingston, Kingston just coming back from an injury, but this is all setting up to a future match with all of these guys. I don't know if there's going to be some other people joining in with Kingston and Moxley because they're they're severely outnumbered. It's like, and I think that's kind of what this whole segment was to illustrate was that they are outnumbered. Maybe they're going to have to find some other people to fight with, or maybe they're going to go it alone. I think only time will tell. But I I'm, I want to know where they're going with this. If are Moxley and Kingston going to call in new people to AEW, or are they going to team up with one of the existing? 5,000 factions, or is this just going to be them going it alone? Britt Baker came out later in the show. Of course, uh, she is now the number one contender. Uh, it's been some big announcements. She's going to be getting her title shot against Sheeta. Sheeta, by the way, you need to follow her on, on uh, Instagram because she is really, 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 really adorable. But um, yeah, Baker making her point here. A lot of people were making their points and making their claims on future matches. Uh, we did find out that Kenny Omega will be facing uh, either Orange Cassidy or Pac in a rematch from that wonderful match from last year's uh, Revolution show because uh, the two of them will be facing off against each other in a number one contenders match essentially. Wh whoever wins will go on and face Kenny Omega at double or nothing for the AEW World Championship. Of course, this prompted Omega to kind of come out and try to big boy everybody else. I do love this return of the crazy inflated ego Kenny Omega. He didn't act like, you know, he didn't want to even talk about Orange Cassidy. And then Orange Cassidy comes out. And then something very interesting happened that I didn't even thought about. Omega basically brought up the fact that Orange Cassidy's character is very similar to Omega's character several years ago in New Japan. You know, the, the lackluster stuff, the shades, the kind of, eh, you know, I'm not going to try kind of thing. And Omega kind of called him out on that a little bit. Uh, but, you know, this, I think that's kind of making people want to see Omega versus Orange Cassidy. I don't see Pac being the one winning this match. So I'm going to just assume at this point in time that Double or Nothing is going to be Orange Cassidy, of all people, going for the AEW Championship against Omega. What probably could be another match of the year contender because Orange Cassidy is a great wrestler. You just don't know it because of his character. And I think Omega is seeing somebody he can have one of these match of the years with. So 
we're gonna see what that all, how that all shakes out in the future. QT Marshall and Cody met and continuing this n former Nightmare Factory, Nightmare Family, whatever feud that's going on. Uh, I think the whole thing, the point of this whole thing was to set up Anthony Agogo. Uh, QT Marshall is not gonna, he is not the focus of this whole thing. This entire feud seems to be a way to introduce Anthony Agogo in a prime spot and to get him in there with Cody because that guy is money. Uh, he's already money, uh, and in AEW, for those of, a lot of us, I didn't know much about him until I restarted research. I'm like, God, this guy's got like history. He's he's, he's a pretty accomplished guy. So uh, establishing him in AEW is the point of all of this. And so far, so I, I do like the way that they're doing it. And again, the, them involving everybody else gives everybody else airtime, and maybe somebody else will break out from this. But I think this was a good setup for the future of a go go and a possible feud with Cody, which. They'll probably have a match at Double or Nothing. We'll wait and see on that. Other people that, you know, have a big pedigree and want to go out to championships in the future is Miro, who came out and after Darby Allen got his butt kicked by Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page and thrown down some steps, which was a very scary spot. And for anybody who's fallen down steps or had a loved one or a family member die from falling down steps, uh, that always makes my skin crawl a little bit. But... Uh, later on, Miro came out and said he's got a contract to face Darby Allen for the TNT Championship in seven days. I think this is basically a death nail in Darby Allen's reign as TNT Champion. I could be wrong, but I think the you, you'd be a good... If you're a betting man, it'd be a good bet to put your money on Miro becoming the next TNT Champion. He's been in AEW a while, and they kind of let him, you know, do a kind of a joke for you with best friends and all that stuff for a while, but now Miro is going to take his place in the upper mid card and winning the TNT Championship is definitely a way to get there. Uh, that TNT Championship is becoming quite quite a thing, you know, in the short lifespan that it's had. And, you know, when it was introduced, a lot of people kind of poo-pooed it. But, you know, between Brody Lee and Darby Allen and Cody and the runs that they've had with the title, it's a, it's a decent championship. They, this is a good, that's, it's kind of a good illustration on the way to build up a championship. Um, so, it has some prestige, and um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Darby Allen and Miro is going to be a very scary match if you're a Darby Allen fan because Miro is going to ragdoll him, and Darby's going into it with an injury already. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how that's all going to work out. The main thing, however, is the blood and guts match, uh, the inner circle versus the pinnacle. This did really, I mean, they did a good job of making this really feel like an old. The old school war games. The old, I'm not talking about the NXT stuff. Even though I did like the last NXT war games that they did. The first couple ones, my complaint, if you remember that from my old channel, was they they would have two, they would have everybody in a ring, and then two people would do a spot, and then they fall down. And then another two people do a spot, and they fall down. Meanwhile, everybody else is just lying on the mat, watching, waiting for everybody to do their spots. And to me, I always said that that's not really what war games was. War games is a game fight. Blood and Guts was a gang fight. This thing was a gang fight from start to finish. Pinnacle comes out first looking like an army. Inner Circle comes out. They're all wearing jumpsuits representing prisons from their hometowns and stuff, which is pretty awesome. They got in there. Of course, we started with Sammy Guevara. And as I thought, Dax, one of FTR, started for uh, the Pinnacle, you know, given that Arn Anderson in the original War Games back in July 4th of 1987, which I vividly remember. Uh, cause I was, I remember buying that video, I could not wait till that videotape came out because as a little bit of a side note back in those days, the Great American Bash was not on pay-per-view, but they hyped it up on TV for that July 4th show. And then, you know, only the people that were in Atlanta got to see it, or I think they may have had closed circuit, but I waited. And when that War Games VHS tape came out back in the eighties, I watched that thing to death. So, yeah, this definitely was in the same vein as that original War Games match. They proceeded through the different time periods. Uh, Pinnacle with the advantage. Sean Spears coming in. Then we had uh, Ortiz. And then you had... Uh, so basically, you just had... They, they spaced the tag teams out to come in staggered uh, with the second-in-command guys, I guess, which would be Sammy and... Uh, Sean Spears and then the Bruisers came in 
uh, right before the main leaders came in. So it was very well structured as far as how the entries worked in this match. A lot of blood, a lot of color in this match. You knew it was going to be, a lot of these guys are old school. A lot of these guys probably study those original War Games videotapes a lot. Uh, that was evident in this match that these guys were definitely students of the original 87 series of War Games. So, uh, I, of course, I love this. This is a different War Games than the NXT one. It is uh, got a little space around the ring, which I thought was a little damaging because I think it was uh, Ortiz fell through. It may have been Santana that fell through the crack between the ring and the cage at one point in the match, which looked really bad. Um, it's got a roof on it, which I like. Because uh, the War Games is supposed to feel like a, a cell. You're, you're big. The point of War Games is to get two gangs locked in a cage to beat the living snot out of each other, and that's what they did. Limited use of gimmicks. I did expect the chairman of AEW to use a chair, but they used that. Uh, but they didn't go through just, okay, we're going to bring in like all of this other stuff into the War Games and do all of these spots. In fact, they did the opposite. They just basically used the ring. They tore off the ring buckle and used the... The turnbuckles, the actual metal spikes of the turnbuckles as weapons, they tore them off the mat and exposed the, the wooden planks underneath. I mean, they were rip not only were they ripping each other up, they were ripping up the ring at the same time. And I love the way they paced this Blood and Guts match. By the end of it, it when finally you get MJF and Jericho coming into this thing, uh, you know, they did the lineup and then everybody ran at each other, which was pretty cool. And you, you've seen that in the NXT versions, which is a great addition to NXT as added to War Games. And then everybody started fighting again. And it's like, again, I said, it looks, it looked like a gang fight. And which is what this was. And eventually MJF tries to get out. Tully Blanchard it opens up the cage door. MJF is able to get out and crawl to the top of the cage. Jericho goes up after him. And, uh, then we see... Uh, kind of a lackluster conclusion to the match, although it made sense at the time. Jericho and MJF are going back and forth. MJF has weakened Jericho's arm, which is kind of a bit surprising because you would think Jericho will win in a brawl against MJF, but MJF got the upper hand. He was going to throw Jericho off the cage onto that platform, which we were all wondering during the entire show, why was this like this extra race platform on the stage? Now we found out why, because it was for the end of this match. Uh, so he threatened to throw Jericho off the top of the cage, uh, Sammy Guevara surrendered, which is a rare thing in war games or blood and guts matches that you don't, it's often submission and in the NXT ones you get pinfalls, but surrender is very rare. I think surrender, I, oh God, I can remember maybe, I think the horseman one when Kurt Hennig, I think that may have been a surrender. Um, I think a surrender may have come with, uh, yeah, it definitely came with the Brian Pillman, the infamous Brian Pillman one where Sid Vicious almost broke his neck <laughs> because he tried to power bomb him in that little, the little height of the cage they had before. Definitely not a problem with this War Games cage. This, this, uh, Blood and Guts cage is about as high as hell in a cell, so. But anyway, you had the surrender here from Sammy Guerrero, surrendering for the team so they wouldn't destroy Jericho, and of course, MJF, we all knew this, MJF was going to throw him off anyway, and he did, and Jericho took the tumble, which was a da damn long fall, it looked like he was falling forever, but when he hit, he hit through, like, you know, this thin little uh, cardboard that had a crash mat underneath it, which a lot of fans complain about, I, it's understandable, Jericho is not, at 50 years old, going to fall 20 feet through a table onto concrete, that's not going to happen. And then they probably could have done it a little better if it kind of fell further down so you didn't see the crash pad. Like if he kind of disappeared into it. Kind of the way Darby Allen did in, uh, in that uh, cinematic they had where you didn't see where he fell. If he kind of just fell into a pit and it was like, oh my God, that would have probably worked out better. But the fall would have been longer. So it's like, we understand why it was. But again, if you can't, it's kind of like the exploding ring thing. If you can't do it, quite right that it looks as devastating as you're trying to hype it up as being maybe don't do the spot so that is an issue with the blood and guts match it wasn't a perfect match the other issue obviously again it's another thing that we as fans understand but it did take away from the match the commercial breaks and they had several commercial breaks through the blood and guts match which i kind of thought they were trying to get rid of that and do all the commercial breaks earlier on, but I guess that I don't know how the contracts work with TNT in the commercial break. But they did have to have several of them. One, the, I think the worst one was when Wardlow came in, and it was in the 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 restaurant quality, as Jr. would say, picture in picture, 
And this great standoff between Wardlow and I think it was both Santana Ortiz and Guevara at the time. And he was just tossing them around like rag dolls. But that whole segment, that whole part of the match we missed. So hopefully uh, AEW will, and I think they probably will, release the full uninterrupted version of the Blood and Guts match on their YouTube channel. I can almost guarantee that that's probably going to happen. So we can re so you can get the, the emotion from those experiences. Because you couldn't hear the crowd. Which also, by the way, they had probably the biggest crowd they've had at Daily's Place. It looked almost... Full. It looked like one of those New Japan shows does now where you got enough people in there. Although, all of those people during the pandemic singing and yelling out Judas, we have an airborne virus that comes out of your mouth. Probably not the best look. <laughs> Half of that crowd had the chin strap mask on or just didn't have mask on at all. So, uh, you know, whatever. Hopefully, we're again, we're nearing the end of this pandemic thing, hopefully. So, I just hope nobody gets sick. Uh, and again, given the news that just happened in New Japan with two of its wrestlers getting sick, and it, and they are way more precautious uh, than what AEW is doing with their show. So, I don't know. Let's just hope everybody's safe. But overall, I, I did like this. It, I understand now why this match happened on Dynamite. Um, it's a probably it's a way to write Jericho off the show for a while because Jericho, I'm sure, you know, we all know Jericho's got a lot of other projects, so he's probably got to go off and do something. I don't know. He may be doing Fozzy stuff. Maybe he's writing a book. Maybe he's being in a movie. Who knows? But it's, again, it's a good way to write Jericho off the show, and it does give Pinnacle, who needed the win more than an Inner Circle did, now a chance to establish themselves at the top. The only problem with that is. With Miro going for the TNT title and Orange Cassidy going for the World Championship, there's not a lot of gold in the future for the Pinnacle. And FTR, I don't think they're going after the tag titles just yet because Young Bucks are now heels. And it looks like they're trying to go. They had the Eliminator match on this show for the, uh, the tag championship. So they're going to another few right now. So I don't know about championships unless they introduce this trios title. And uh, maybe that will be something that the uh, Pinnacle can get. But the Pinnacle is going to just have to start gathering championships as the year goes on to kind of really cement that faction as being the, the, the natural progression from the Four Horsemen and even to some extent evolution uh, to now the Pinnacle. Those are my views on the Blood and Guts edition, Cinco de Mayo of AEW Dynamite. I want to know what you guys thought about it, though. If you enjoyed it or not, let your voice be heard in the comment box below. Until then, if you like this video, again, hit that like button. Throw it right off the top of the cage, right through the crash pads, and just smash the crap out of it. And the subscribe button, and just throw the notification bell off of there as well. Help out the channel. Thank you very much. I appreciate it every time you guys do that. It does help out a lot. I will see you guys next time for more news, rumors, and commentary right here on The Ranton Review. Have a good day.